one. Thank you very much for the foundation. I have quite an eccentric role here because most of the reflections have to do with justice and fight for or struggle rather for human rights and I'm here as a policymaker who coincidentally has a role in the parliament and its justice committee. And so, I have a question about the repeal of, uh, against universal jurisdiction in Spain, which is what we've heard of um, in these days. It is not a reform of the judiciary law, not just uh, that it's not an attempt to narrow down or limit international criminal jurisdiction, it is just the expedited repeal of international criminal law. But there is this play, this uh, book that got my eye back in the day, which I think has to do with the dynamics after World War II having to do with a criminal jurisdiction. Duramat, visiting the old lady, thinks about the attempt by the old lady to achieve vengeance in exchange for paying a people's debt. And as for the repeal of international criminal law, we've only been paying attention to debt. Originally, with the repeal during the last counter-reform of the criminal jurisdiction in Spain, debt is there. We see the business relationship with China, with the US. It is business against justice. But we forgot about vengeance. And I have this idea, I'm under the impression, and, and I think I'm right when I say that it is time for the lawmaker, it is time for most of the, of the governments and people in the government to put an end to an international criminal law, but also to the attempt to reopen here in Spain investigation towards justice, truth and reparation with regard to crimes and the Franco's regime. It is not a coincidence that we see criminal law change in Spain as, as, as a repeal at the same time as we see that crimes and the Franco's regime will not be investigated, that they've been filed away in the legal system and of course we can discuss uh, the the approach at the Supreme Court, but we see that this is now only possible in Argentina thanks to the contribution of Justice Servini. I think this is important, and I think it is very important from a political point of view. In that very same play by Duremont, we see as well what's known or discussed earlier today about transitional justice. We find the ethical dilemma, we find a political dilemma at the same time. As part of that approach put forward by the old lady, and this is vengeance in exchange for debt. Back then, the political discussion would be, is a life worth what the, the, the people's future is worth, the people of that society? And I guess this is also an ethical and, and political dilemma that we find in Spain and which I understand that can only be solved in these ways. First, public discussion that needs to take place and which is closely related to truth, to getting to know what happened, getting to know the facts. Then we need to have democratic procedures in place and processes in place where we have democratic participation and representation. And thirdly, we need to abide by the law. We need to abide by the constitution. And as part of international criminal jurisdiction, well, we see how all these criteria are not met. In repeal, in this repeal, there is no discussion. 
the same as with the partial repeal by previous governments, in the full repeal by this uh, government, discussion is precluded. Actually, now is when, uh, afterwards, now is when we find a discussion, public discussion. But in the past, it was expedited, it was summary, it was uh, a fraud. And so there is no room for deliberation, there is no room for discussion, and so no political or ethical claims are filed. Then democratic process. What we lived back in, in the uh, parliament was this single hearing, right once, and it was a weird proposal by a parliamentary group supporting the government in power to take away constitutional bodies. They wanted to avoid the powers of those bodies, such as the prosecutor's office and other offices. They are not entitled to any assessment of this proposal, which is not a proposal from the government, but from a specific government in, in, in parliament. And so it seems that there is no option there, there's no way around it to, to, to circumvent this lack of consultation, because it's just about amendment to mistakes, to errors, but what errors are we talking about? Because it's not just about impunity of criminals who have committed genocide or crimes against humanity, it's not just impunity in case of torture, but it is also true that we find that it's impunity in the fight against drug dealing. When there is a full amendment proposal, which is unheard of in the parliament, when they correct their own mistakes and they send this proposal, they want to have a new amendment in, uh, which they think will help them in the fight against drug dealing. And I think this is preposterous for victims since it opens a way where we see that it opens up, as, again, to terrorism, but it's, it closes the way to other types of crimes, such as crimes against humanity or genocide. You see here a double measure, a double standard, rather, that it's difficult to justify unless you explain it because of un, uh, unconfessed uh, hopes and, and wishes. As for the contents of this standard, which is international criminal jurisdiction and its repeal, I think it's been fully discussed here. There's not much more I can add. But I would like to say that it is not constitutional. First of all, it's outside all international conventions. So it is in disagreement with Article number 10 of our Constitution. And then, because victims are left unprotected. So effective protection, legal protection is going down the drain. And there's another decision that has an impact in the independence of the judiciary powers, which is that they try to file away pending cases which are under a significant international pressure. They are under the eye of the international community. So I don't think this is just about a business or a political purpose, but I think it is closely related to the historical memory in our country. And the final uh, Clean Slate Act that was aspired, that, that, that was hoped for with um, Gatson's case. As for the truth, and it's been mentioned before, here in our country, we do not have a shared narration, a, a shared threat or argument about um, crimes under Franco's regime. There's not a truth. There might be a historical truth there where those are understood as crimes against humanity. But as for the memory running down our streets, streets institutional memory, it's just contrary to real historical memory. For example, in Valverdios, there will be a tribute paid to a bunch of criminals, criminals that should be in the, in the hall of shame, but still they are being, they are getting a tribute. So there's not a shared memory. There's no, no justice 
in our country. Actually, our justice lies now with Argentina. The Supreme Court thinks that there is no option for justice in our country. And from a political point of view, there's been no reparation because the Historical Memory Act has been a failure that has not been fully developed and in especially one of these elements that was the overriding or the annulment of, uh, of trials under Franco's regime. And so it is a failed act, a failed law. This is, uh, I understand, the theoretical situation we find ourselves in comparing it to Duvermatt's work or play where we see the contradiction between vengeance, justice, and uh, ethical and policy making. In Duramat's play, lights go down and vengeance takes place. I think lights gone down, but vengeance not been achieved. I think historical memory is still out there those that fight for historical memory are out there. The proceedings that are going on in, in Argentina, and I think that our judges in the High Court has proven with the actions that they're still a long way ahead of us, and those that have opted for a clean slate trial, a clean slate act, they are wrong. They're clearly and profoundly wrong. Thank you very much. What are the real chances to start an inconstitutional proceeding against a law that has overridden international law in Spain? How can we do so? We know the requirements, but we also need the number of MPs which limits that to the majority parliament opposition group. Even if we join together all other votes uh, from other parties, that would be not enough. So there is a commitment by the Socialist Party at a conference at the parliament. It is a public commitment before the associations and victims and recently, the Socialist Parliament group has said this is a robust, sound compromitment. We've made our signature published. If they wanted to, fill, to, to sign the appeal and the arguments, you can find them everywhere. And there have been different groups, organizations and institutions asking for the appeal. And so it is just about uh, filing the appeal and do it, uh, doing it at a time, and we'll ask them to do so.